This is a waved albatross, one of the rarest seabirds in the world. She has spent the past few months alone, far out to sea, but now she has just made it back to the island where she was born, and she's looking for someone. There are tens of thousands of birds here, but there's only one who she wants to see, her partner. If you thought love stories were just a human thing, think again because albatrosses are monogamous, meaning that they only mate with one other individual and the couples will stay together for their entire lives, sometimes over 40 years. They develop quite a bond in all that time. I mean, look at this. You can't tell me those guys aren't feeling something. These two are really gonna need each other because they have a serious challenge ahead of them, raising a new chick. That may not sound like a big deal, but here's the problem. She can only lay one egg per year, so they only have one shot to make it work. As if that wasn't enough, waved albatrosses only breed on one island in the entire world. And though the chick needs a lot of food, their best feeding grounds can be over 60 miles away. At this point, you may be wondering how a strategy this risky could ever work out, but it does. And it's unlikely stories of success like this that have always fascinated us. My name is Harrison, and this is Evan. We're twin brothers on a mission to help you become an insider in the natural world, which starts by showing you that we're not so different from even the most exotic wildlife on our planet. And in fact, the albatross's story is much more human than you would ever imagine. Today, we have come to the island of Española to dive into the fascinating and surprisingly sweet ways these birds are able to beat the odds and reproduce despite all the challenges they face. To do this, we first want to look at what these birds are actually doing at their breeding sites. And once we got to the island, it did not take us long to find them. We have just arrived on the island and there's actually an albatross right in front of us. This is absolutely crazy. It's actually on the only path on the island, if that gives you a sense of how infrequently people visit this place. I'm gonna show you, we have to stay very far away. There it is, our first waved albatross, but we will see a lot more. I cannot believe this. One of the rarest birds in the entire world. This is a dream come true to explore a habitat that almost no humans ever get to visit. The albatrosses form large colonies on different points across the island, and you have to really watch your step when you're exploring them because they will nest on just about any exposed patch of ground, including the path. So though we did have to be very careful, we had the opportunity to see some pairs very close up. Now, once the female finds her partner, they share some really adorable moments because this is the first time that they're reconnecting in months. And that makes sense, right? Because if you hadn't seen your partner for months at a time, you'd be happy to see them too. And they are mostly solitary during the non-breeding season since they spend pretty much all of their time foraging way out at sea in the food-rich waters off the coasts of Ecuador and Peru. And it's not until late March or early April that the birds return to the island of Española, where the entire world population of waved albatrosses will breed. And it's not a huge population either, it numbers somewhere between 34 and 35,000 pairs at the last estimate. Once they're back together, the albatrosses reaffirm their pair bond with a variety of really cute behaviors, including beak clacking, calling to each other, and an elaborate but very rarely seen courtship dance. They don't have much time for ceremony though, because there's only a very limited window that they have to lay their eggs, because albatross development takes a very long time. Time. Again, the albatross can only lay one egg in a season, so they're putting all of their efforts and all their hopes into this one opportunity. The egg will take about two months to incubate, and during this time, the parents will trade off duties caring for the egg and going out to feed at certain areas between 10 and 100 kilometers away from the breeding site. By summer, the chicks will have hatched, and they'll start the long five-month period of development, during which time the chick is entirely dependent on their parents for food. This is where the challenges really start for the couple, because with their feeding grounds being so far away from their nesting sites, they're not able to bring back live fish or even much whole prey at all for the juveniles. Instead, they produce a nutrient-rich oil in their stomachs with the food that they've caught, which is extremely high in fats and protein, which allows the chick to grow as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, we visited the islands too early to see any of the chicks, but we did see a lot of promising signs that many of the couples have already been successful this season. 
Already, what we're seeing is pretty encouraging. There are tons of albatrosses here nesting, at least 50, maybe more, and a lot of them are sitting on eggs, which is a really good sign. We love to see that there are still birds that are producing eggs, and it's fascinating to see how close we can actually get to them. Even though they are not accustomed to people, there are no humans that live on this island, they don't seem to mind our presence whatsoever. As long as we give them enough space that they don't feel that their nest is threatened, we can get nice and close and get some crazy shots. This is absolutely unbelievable and really encouraging because if the birds are doing well here, that's a really good sign for their population. With the amount of eggs we've seen, it seems like the albatross's efforts are working out. But now it's time to get into the cool part. What makes this unlikely strategy actually successful? As humans, monogamy kind of intuitively makes sense as a good way for us to raise our offspring. But for birds that get so few opportunities to reproduce, you'd think they'd take every chance they can get to breed. So the question is, why do these birds stay monogamous? Well, for one thing, having monogamous parents is a huge advantage to the chick. It takes an incredible amount of time and effort to raise an albatross chick since they require a lot of food on a regular basis to grow. With two parents devoting their full energy to caring for one offspring, it gives the chick the best chance of getting the resources they need to fully develop. But monogamy doesn't just benefit the chicks, it also makes things easier to manage for the parents. One albatross on its own would not be able to provide enough food while also keeping the chick safe. So they actually require the help of their partner in order for the chick to survive. When they first hatch, the chick can only last about a week between feedings. But a full foraging run can take the adult between 7 and 10 days. So the parent that stays behind to care for the young needs to be sure that their partner will return in time with the food that their chick is waiting for. If the parent on babysitting duty didn't think that their partner would make it back, they'd only have one or two days to go on a foraging run themselves. And realistically, there's no way they could make this call soon enough to bring enough food back for the chick before it starves. So much of their relationship and parenting strategy is dependent on trust that the parents really need to be confident in their partner to hold up their end of the arrangement. Because if either party fails, it's unlikely that the chick would survive. This is really what makes monogamy so beneficial for these birds. After spending several successful breeding seasons together, they start to develop a level of trust that makes future breeding efforts more likely to be successful too. Since they understand each other's habits and they know that they can rely on their partner to help share the burden of parenthood. This is something I think we can relate to also. Imagine trying to raise a new child with a different partner every year versus doing it with someone that you already have a trusted bond with. It would be way easier to manage such a massive undertaking with someone you already trust, right? The same is true for the albatrosses. When you think about it that way, it actually makes sense that monogamy is the best strategy for the birds to raise their chicks. But there's another aspect of their breeding habits that still may strike you as odd. Waved albatrosses can travel incredible distances, so why do they restrict themselves to only breeding on one island in a remote archipelago? To answer that question, you first have to understand how they build their nests. Right here in front of me is an albatross nest. This is one of the eggs of the waved albatross, and you can see they lay them right on the ground. There's almost no protection at all. But here on Española, that's not a problem. There are no natural predators, no invasive species here on this island, so it's the perfect place for the albatrosses to raise their chicks. Given how precious their egg is to the couple, you might expect the albatrosses to make a really elaborate nest to protect it. But actually, their nest structure is about as basic as it could possibly be. They don't even make a simply constructed nest. They essentially lay their egg right on the ground, sometimes in a small scrape in the sand. Because the eggs are left so exposed, you might expect them to be extremely vulnerable to predation. But that's where the unique conditions on Española come into play. There are no ground predators on the island at all. Virtually all of the invasive species have already been removed, and even the few predatory birds that do exist on the island, like the Española Mockingbird and the Galapagos Hawk, only pose a minimal threat to the albatrosses unless they leave their eggs unattended for a significant period of time. The lack of nest threats does allow the albatrosses to leave their egg for short periods of time in order to search for food, where it will be guarded by one of the parents or even another bird, as albatrosses are cooperative breeders, which means that they will sometimes look after offspring that aren't their own for short periods of time. It's not just the lack of predators on Española that make it an ideal nursery for the albatrosses. The physical structure of the island is also perfectly suited for the challenge of learning how to fly. 
This is exactly what we were hoping to see. Multiple albatrosses all nesting right in this flat open area. This is one of the only places in the world that these birds will nest. And this particular point that we're standing on right now is extremely important for these birds. They actually use this as a natural staging area when the young are trying to learn how to fly. There is a cliff that extends over the ocean here and the young birds will fly off, stretch their wings out and the updraft that comes from the wind bouncing off the rocks allows them to propel their huge bodies and their giant wings into the air. And their bodies are so large and their wings are so long that they actually need that natural drop. And that gives them their first test of flight as they will spend weeks at a time over the ocean searching for prey as they reach adult size. The unique geography of Española helps both the babies and the adults because actually taking flight is pretty difficult for these large and heavy birds. They're quite awkward on land, and in order to take off, they need a sufficiently large flat space to give them a running start to get the amount of speed they require. They also rely heavily on wind to launch them into the air, so that's why they'll often run off of cliffs or drops in order to give them a boost. This is even more important for the juveniles, who have to learn to fly and develop their flight muscles by using these cliffs as a sort of airport to get them into flight for the first time. They really need to learn quickly, because once they fledge and leave the nest, they won't return to land for around four to six years, spending their adolescent years over the ocean feeding and growing. They will not associate with their parents again even after returning to the island, because by then it will be time for them to start families of their own and continue the incredible cycle that gave them the chance to survive against all odds. The beautiful story of the waved albatross is also a fragile one as these critically endangered birds are facing a number of serious threats. Since they rely entirely on the ocean for their food, they're extremely susceptible to prey shortages brought about by global climate change, which can lead to widespread breeding failures and eventually increase divorce rates as a result. But while climate change does strongly impact their population, the majority of the albatross's threats come directly from people. Española is protected as a part of the Galapagos National Park, but it still receives a lot of ecotourism which can damage the habitat they rely on and disturb the albatrosses that nest close to the trails. And the protection from the National Park only extends to the boundaries of the archipelago. When the albatrosses venture further away from the islands in search of food, they have to face their biggest killer, longline fishing. Longline fishing involves setting hundreds or even thousands of baited hooks strung together on long fishing lines that often stretch for many kilometers. But when the albatrosses swoop down to capitalize on what seems like an easy meal, they end up getting dragged underwater and drown instead. Longline fisheries are responsible for the deaths of thousands of waved albatrosses every year, making them the single biggest cause of albatross mortality. The death of even a single individual is a big deal for these birds, because when one partner in a couple dies, the widow has never been observed taking a new mate. Without their partner, the widow will never reproduce again, which means that not only has a critically endangered bird been lost, but many future generations that the couple would have produced as well. You can probably see where this is going, right? Lose enough birds, break up enough couples, and the population will start to shrink. And here's the really scary part. This decline is already happening. Even in the face of these extreme challenges, all hope is not lost for the waved albatross. It is possible to save them, but it will take the combined efforts of many people to mitigate their threats from fishing, protect their habitat, and ensure that the climate stays in a range that can support them. That is where you come in. Just by watching this video and sharing it with others, you're helping to raise awareness and generate support for these amazing birds, and they'll need all the help they can get to keep their touching stories going into the future. If you want to learn about another mind-blowing survival strategy from here in the Galapagos that may be even crazier than the albatrosses, check out this video where we dive deep into the unbelievable life story of the marine iguana. And with that, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you in the next one.